Hello, and welcome to How To Be In The Spotlight with me, Rylan. The podcast where I speak to those who've been thrust into the public eye, but lived to tell the tale. My guest today is the stunning actor and comedian, Emily Atak. There's some strong language in this one, and some topics you might find upsetting. Hello, gorgeous. Hello. You look beautiful. That's so nice of you to say. It's a lie. Yeah, well, I was just, <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. It is a lie, but you know, times are... It's not. You look absolutely stunning. Thank Welcome you. to How To Be In The Spotlight. You were definitely someone I really wanted to talk to about this because, I mean, darling, you were pretty much bred to be in the spotlight. The first question I asked all my guests is what does being in the spotlight mean to you? Oh, God. Um, now it's completely different. It was all about talent and it was all about um, the craft. It had nothing to do with social media, Instagram. Now you've got to be your own brand. Mm. You've got to be good at selling things. Yeah. And everyone, you've got to be on all the time. Mm. And I grew up in that world thinking that actresses, actors, performers, you do your gig and then you're done for a bit, mm. you know. But now it's like you have to be on all the time. Never it's off. No. And that's obviously social media. And I just, I find that so difficult to keep up with. I can't. I love doing the bits that I do. I love my job. Yeah. But I can't, I'm struggling so much with the social media side of it. I'm rubbish. I'm shit at it. <laughs> I can't, my, my bedroom's not tidy enough. Yeah. My nails aren't done. You know, and they do the little tap on the shampoo bottle. Get ready with me. I, I can't. I... I mean, you can get ready with me, but I look like Mrs. Doubtfire in the rubber suit. <laughs> so already that's, you know, I you can come and get ready with me, but it ain't pretty. Oh, babe, um, no. stop doing yourself a disservice, no, please. No, but it's true. I, I can't, it's it's another thing that I, I struggle with. So being in the spotlight, to me, I grew up thinking it was a very different thing. Mm. Um, everybody is now in the spotlight. Fame used to be a, quite an exciting and rare thing. It's weird that you say that because let's go back. Yeah. A little M. Because you had all of that around you. Yeah. From the second you left the womb. Yeah. So explain to my listeners what childhood was like growing up in what I would like to call a dynasty of a family. Oh, that's nice. So mum, mum is Kate Robbins, actress, singer, impressionist. Um, wrote Surprise, Surprise. She wrote Surprise, Surprise. Surprise. Surprise, surprise. Oh, it runs that in the family. Good, actually. I've never that done that before. Real, that's the best-seller impression oh, I've gosh, heard in at least two days. <laughs> yeah, it should be two minutes. Um, and she did like Spitting Image mm. and uh, she used to go to Edinburgh with all of her shows and did stand-up comedy. And You've missed out a really big thing. What's that? She did Eurovision. She did Eurovision. Yeah. Came sec third. 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 I think Bucks Fears beat them. Yeah. Yeah, she, she's still really bitter about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up with that. My mum was this kind of incredible, vivacious, huge personality. One of the earliest memories I have of watching her in something, we, we were in Edinburgh and uh, she was doing one of her shows and someone came up to her, must have been about nine years old. And they said, they said, God, your mum is one hell of a woman, isn't she? And I was like, one hell of a woman, that's that's good. I like that that phrase. Um, so I yeah, I just grew up knowing my mum was very different. And you only have to look at her at the school gates to know that she was Fair very different. Cigarette. Hello, darling. Yeah. Hello, Two love. hours late. And she, you know, she had like the leathers on and she was just so stunning. Um, <laughs> always late. You know, she wasn't the PTA meeting kind of mum. And she she looked at parents' evenings like they were such a massive chore and we'd all go for a curry afterwards. You know, it wasn't we'd all have a little bollocking yeah. and then go. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was different, but you know, it was, it was great fun. She taught me to just, to always be creative and it wasn't really an issue if we didn't do our maths homework, stay in school kids, <laughs> but, um, it was all about creativity and just kind of, we were very encouraged to be the people we wanted to be and pursue the things that we wanted to pursue. And what about the rest of your family? Um, and then there's my dad, Keith. Keithy boy. Big up Keith. Yeah. He was Bonnie Tyler's guitarist for oh. 30 years. And so our, a lot of our childhood was was spent going on tour with Bonnie Tyler. And I used to like, when I was literally about six years old, I'd clump around in her heels from her cupboard. Um, that was my, yeah, that was that was my childhood. And it, it is funny because obviously with my dad, he's, Bonnie Tyler is the superstar, you know. Yeah. But I, I would go to these gigs and we'd be stood at the side of the stage and I'd be thinking, you it's know, my dad. That, uh, uh, all these people have come in to see my dad. Yeah. I didn't. 
didn't really care about Bonnie Tyler. It was like, oh my God, my dad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was very proud of my parents. They were gorgeous and and funny and God, we all had such a laugh. We were a gang. Yeah. It was fucking mental and chaotic. <laughs> you um, don't say. <laughs> but it was, it was great. It was great fun. I knew, I knew we were all a little bit different and some people sort of say, you know, oh, compared to the Kardashians, right? No, more like the Osbournes. Yeah, it very was much so. Chaos, yeah. absolute chaos, but it was great fun. And we were very loved, smothered with love. Did you know that you were always going to be in the spotlight? Yes, you did. always. Because this is very different to any other of my guests. Yeah. And also, where, you know, when people sort of say, where people go, did you always want to be famous? And people say, no, bollocks. They're liars. It's bollocks. Yeah. All right, I can't speak for everyone, but fame to me was about, it, it wasn't what it is now. You can sort of be famous for kind of anything now. It was about celebrating the things that you were good at. And I wanted to be a famous actress. That's what I wanted. And I I would have little characters that I do in my bedroom. I had, I had a red cloak and I used to call myself Lola Red. That was like my first little character. I used to put mum's lip gloss on and like practice my slow-mo kind of <laughs> whip round of, um, you know, when credits come up in a film. We had such a similar character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that I, yeah, I knew. And mum and dad would make jokes about how, you know, you come, you get off the plane at the airport and you walk through um, and, the, and everyone's waiting at the airport. The, the joke was that they were all my fans. I know everyone makes that joke, but I truly believe that they you, were. It was real. No, no, yeah. they were. So like, I'd no, like, are. at nine years old, like fully getting glammed up on the plane, like the smile in eyes. Shades with the, with my little, tiny little bag. Please, no photos. Yeah. <laughs> so that, and that was always the way. And I, I was the, I liked being the center of attention. I was copying what I grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. For me, that is fascinating because <laughs> most people I talk to, like myself, you know my story. It's something I always wanted. Yeah. But whether it was attainable or not. Yeah. Is something very different. And also I, f I feel like, I feel like the word famous has become a bit of a dirty word because yeah. people don't want to admit no. that they want to be famous because in some way it takes away their integrity. Or their credibility. Yeah. and But actually, if, if you sort of look back at footage of like Marilyn Monroe, because back then fame wasn't a dirty word. They all say- It was in these celebrated. Interviews, yeah, they were like, I just want to be loved and adored by everybody. I really always wanted to be famous. It's like, that's secretly how people feel now. They just yeah. don't want to admit it. Because they're frightened of what yeah. people will say about yeah. them. And, and nowadays it's kind of like, you, you know, you can be famous for so for completely different things. It's not just about talent anymore. And fame isn't as mesmerizing anymore because it's easier to, to achieve, I think. Do you think you could have been anything else other than what you are? No. Really? Absolutely. It wasn't even, I mean, I was like, oh God, I was so naughty at school. I, I didn't want to do my, the, the maths classes and the science classes. I, I didn't understand what was going on. I just wanted to do drama and I just wanted to do music. And, you know, everyone was kind of, when it came to kind of GCSEs and things like that and people picking all their things, I just, I wanted to get the hell out of there. I knew what I wanted to do and I needed to just get out and do it quickly. And yeah, I mean, it all goes very kind of scary when you actually get out there and you realize how frightening the industry is and your innocence gets ripped away from you a little bit. But yeah, at the time I was like, no, I know, I know what I'm going to do. I want to be a famous actress and that's, that's what's going to happen. You know, now we would talk about the term Nepo baby. Yeah. But I suppose yeah. technically we could look back and go, well, yeah, I was a Nepo baby. I grew up into a family mm. that were in this industry and lo and behold, I'm in this industry. Yeah. But that's through your own merit. Yeah, totally. And, and also I think, I mean, you know, Yes, we we grew up in that industry, so I guess there are elements of nepo baby kind of vibes. But I I take that as a good thing because it gave me the tools to learn about rejection and learn about the the difficulties of the industry and not just you from know, a young age. Yeah, from a really young age, I d it wasn't just me naively going in knowing it was all going to be perfect. And you know, because this is the thing when you watch th these reality stars kind of achieving this overnight success. And then when it all kind of goes to pieces or they get cancelled for something they say or they go on Big Brother and it doesn't go very well or something like that, you what their whole world crumbles Pull because up. they don't know how to deal with that rejection. Whereas I've had years of rejection, years of auditioning things, not getting them. And but you just, you know, I've I've learned to be very kind of strong with that and and understand it. And I think, yeah, that is coming from a family 
that get it. I have the tools to cope with the rejection and the, you know, if there's a fucking horrible headline out there about you and it for two days you go, ah, pillow over your head and then you're all right. You know, I don't, I don't go to pieces about it. But I want to go back to when you first got your first gig, let's Ooh. say. Can you remember that first moment when you were like, yep. done it? I mean, I mean, talk about cocky. I'm sort of going back on everything I've just said, but I <laughs> I was a bit cocky I because I, I left school, left school when I was 16 and my parents had just divorced and, you know, that was all very upsetting and horrible. And me and my sister were actually living in a flat, you know, from a very young age. And, you know, I needed to pay the rent. And my mum's agent at the time, uh, and I'll always thank him for this, Malcolm Browning, he believed in me, you know, he thought I had something and he thought I was talented. And so he took me on and he said to me, right, you've got your first audition tomorrow. It's for a crime drama on ITV called Blue Murder. He said, look, realistically, you're not going to get it. It's your first ever audition. But here are the lines. Learn them. You need to go. get into this now. You need to yes, start going through yeah. them motions. And he was like, oh, you know, if I get some good feedback, um, I'll know what to work on with you and things like that. Let's just see what happens. Great. So. I learned the lines. I went in fully dressed up. My character was called Kelly Lang and I was a footballer's girlfriend. You know, I was all like glammed up and I was literally 16, not even 17 yet. And I went in and I did it and I got the part. And I'll never forget getting on set for the first time and seeing Caroline Quentin, you know. Dame Caroline, Caroline Quentin. And to me then I was just, and I remember, I remember sort of going, thinking about it before going, this can't be real. I can't, I'm actually going to go on a set and act with Caroline Quentin. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I got there and I did it. And she was so, so lovely and so helpful. And like, obviously, as you know, the director will ask you to go again and yeah. again until it's right. And I kept thinking, <clears throat> is it me? Yeah, I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. I'm doing it wrong. But she was explaining to me, no, 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 this is very normal. Shots, it's this. Yeah. It's um, and so she kind of taught me all of that stuff. But this is really interesting because none of this was new to you. You'd no, seen yeah. sets, you'd yeah. seen television mm. cameras, you'd seen directors. However, yeah. it was always aimed at someone else. Yes, completely. Now it's on you. Yes. So what did that pressure feel like? It felt it felt terrifying, but so thrilling. And I, I was just completely born to do it. I just felt like there was no other no other way for mm. me, you know? And I just, I felt like I've been working towards that moment my entire life, you know, mm. all the cloaks and all the dancing in my room and, you know, snogging my Lola. curtains. Um, all of that has had led to this moment. And it, yeah, it just, it completely clicked into place. And then from there, the in-betweeners came really quickly after that. Well, that is the one thing that really propelled you yeah. into the spotlight as your yes. own individual. Yeah. It was quite tough mm -hmm. looking back. How old were you? I was when you 17 when so I got 17 the years old. Yeah, yeah. So still barely I was a year the youngest cast school. member. Yeah. yeah. And you're cast as Charlotte Big Tits. Yeah. As everyone knew you as. <laughs> a sexual person, very confident, very out there, very in control of what she's doing. Mm -hmm. Now to me, that's the perfect role for you. Yeah. Because I know you. Yeah. And you are a confident girl. You're the, you're everything that that character could be, mm -hmm. right? But you're also a 17-year-old Emily Atak. Yes. You're not Charlotte. Yes. So how did you find the correlation between being this Charlotte big tits mm. that people would probably shout at you in the street, yep. roll down their windows. Even and, now. And even now. How did you find that? Because the in-betweeners blew up. Do you know, it was the little things about it that felt overwhelming. The sort of recognition and the fame side of it, I kind of, I feel like I've always been... Adapted the, to that. Yeah, and that I've always been the centre of attention anyway, even at school. So genuinely, the, the sort of recognition and the fame and people talking about me in newspapers all of a sudden, all of that, it, that wasn't really always the scary bit. It was things like... I realised I'd never had a an issue with my weight before, for example. And then when the in-betweeners came out, people were being so nasty about my weight. Mm. But then some people were saying, no, it's really good to see a curvy girl playing a sex symbol. A sexy... Yeah. But then I thought, I didn't know my weight was ever going to be discussed, ever. Yeah. So that was, it was things like that that, were, that was quite jarring. And it was confusing because I was being labelled as the sexy pin-up but also being highly criticised for my weight and my eyes are too close together. So how does hair. a 17 year old girl deal with that? I just dealt with it. I just thought that that, okay, this is just what has to happen. There's no way out of it. This is fame and this is 
what you have to deal with. What's so funny though is that, you know, it was the sexy schoolgirl role, but I really was just a schoolgirl. Yeah. And people say, yeah, but you know, you know, you you're asking for that kind of attention. When you played this part. Yes, I, I just left school. Yeah. And also I don't blame the in-betweeners. I don't blame the writers or the people for writing this character and putting me in a school uniform. I was in a school uniform because I was playing a schoolgirl. You know, and yes, okay, it, the, there were things I had to do in it that were, you know, had to do a sex scene and things like that. But, and also this was an age before social media really took off. Yeah, so, it was the it was the early, early days of Facebook even. Yes, completely. Yeah, no Twitter. Yeah, and I remember, I remember when the, the first series came out and I got thousands of friend requests on Facebook. I was accepting them all. I was like, Loving everyone life. wants to be my mate. Yes. But yeah, the ugly sides of it kind of came later. I was innocently just doing a job. I was playing a role that I loved playing. I was looked after on that set. The boys were great. The writers were great. I, okay, I was quite young. You know, I did my first lads mag when I was about 17. I did Loaded magazine, um, you know, front page of Loaded magazine in your pants. But at the time, that was how you promoted your work as a girl. A lot of women yeah. did it. And I, I had no problem with it. You know, there were probably girls out there who who hated it, but I, I didn't mind doing it at all. I was, you were game. I you were really game was. For it. And I just I just had it really kind of drilled into me that this is the way that it's done. This is how you promote work. Um, you ha Everyone has to find you sexy and attractive. And, you know, you've got to be a little bit... Uh, uh. Mm. I was all right with that. It worked for me for a really long time. And I went to these photo shoots, FHM, Loaded, you know, all of that. I went with my mum. Kate Robbins was always there, you know on standby and I worked with some lovely photographers. I got to wear some beautiful clothes, beautiful lingerie. Did you feel I empowered? Did yes, you feel sexy? Yes, I did, I did. And I felt innocent. I, I genuinely, I didn't feel like I was doing anything naughty. See, that's so refreshing to hear that. Yeah. Because I, we hear a lot of, and rightly so, we hear a lot mm, of horror stories and, yeah. um, and it's great that people come forward and, and speak mm -hmm. about their experiences. Yeah. But it's actually very refreshing to hear someone sit there and go, yeah, I was young. Yeah. But I had my head screwed on. Yeah. I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't happy with the position or whatever, I'd say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. Fine. So you you were luckily very in control of what you were doing yeah. and embracing it. Yes. I was. I, what, and lucky is, is the right word because I didn't, I'm aware that there are so many young girls out there who hated these photo shoots. And yeah. they, look, they look back on it as a really dark time in their lives. A lot, you know, lots of glamour girls and things. But... I, I was never treated badly on those shoots. Also, but celebrating your youth and your body, I'm never going to look like that again. I've still got the plaques, those underwear plaques on my wall in my house. <laughs> I'm never going to look like that again. I looked amazing and I'd get the photos back and I loved it. Coming out of the in-betweeners when that's finished, mm. let's be honest, you were quite typecast mm -hmm. as that girl. Yeah. How did it feel going out into the world after being that 17-year-old girl that got her big break? Mm -hmm. The in between is finished, three series and done. What's next? I actually got to a point where the acting work was slowly starting to dry up because I was in a really unusual position of, well, I'm not quite young enough and slim enough anymore to do the sexy schoolgirls. So nobody kind of knew what to do with me. My body was changing, I was getting older. I mean, I say older, you know, I was late 12, 20s, but yeah. we know what this industry is like, you know. And I realised that and I thought, right, I'm going to have to do something now that takes me away from the pin-up image. Because sadly, with a pin-up image, what I'd learned is that you, if you want to show your talent and be smart and have interesting things to say, you you can't do both. Can't have your tits out. Yeah, you can't have your boobies out. So I realised that I had to do something different, reinvent myself. So the jungle came knocking. Yeah. And I... And that, let's be honest, there's nowhere to hide. Yes, exactly. And I thought, do you know what? This is the perfect thing because I I, I was a jobbing actress kind of going from job to job. I didn't have enough money. I, I'd gone through a breakup. I was going through a bit of a, you know, like life-changing, finding myself kind of vibe. And uh, I thought, what better way? You know, most people just go to a yoga retreat. Yeah. But um, I decided to do I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. And I wanted people to know who I was as a person. I wanted people to realise that I'm not Charlotte. And uh, yes, I've done lads magazines and, and all that, but I've got so much more to say. Um, I'm an intelligent person. Basically trying to prove to people that mm. I can be this sexy girl that does yeah. lads mags, but I can also be this intelligent woman. Yeah. And so with The Jungle, it was perfect because I think everybody expected me to be the shower, sexy girl. I fucking wish. 
I I wasn't that. I was something very different and I had more to say and people got to know me as a person and it went exactly... How you wanted it yeah, to. Yeah, how I wanted it to. And then from there you go, right, I need to now make some really big decisions when I come out of there. Yeah. There's a strategy. No, there is a strategy. There is. And the strategy was to uh, come out the jungle and start showcasing some talents and some skills you know, I wanted to write my own things. I wanted to be in the writer's room and I wanted to, I wanted to perform. I wanted to do silly voices. I wanted to do stand up, all these things. But what's hilarious is that you, you come out of something like the jungle. And again, people try and box you. They try. I always feel that with the lads, you come out of the jungle. If you're a guy, the jobs are all lined up. They're all there. There's a system in place and it all you, the ladder just goes up and up and up and it's great rightly so there's some really talented men out there that have come out of the jungle and it's all gone great but there's something about as a woman i i everybody expected again i'd come out of the jungle and be doing all the sort of samey stuff that happens a lot of the time when you come out but i wanted to do different things i wanted to do stand up i wrote my own uh, stand up tour, Talk 30 to Me. And then from there, I got my series, The Emily Atak Show, which mm. is impressions, stand up, everything. But the annoying thing you. is that, you know, that was met with eye rolling again and people kind of going, you know, stay you, in you your can't, lane. Yes, yeah, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. But men do it absolutely fine. But men get given the ladder, we get given the box. Mm. And I just refused to let that happen. I was like, no. And also, it, it, people have to remember that to me, doing stand up, comedy, uh, voices, impressions, all those things. That, that is in my blood. That's mm. truly authentically Born who I to am. do it. Yeah. And the, the underwear stuff and all that stuff, that just naturally kind of happened because that at the time worked for me. I, I was playing these sexy roles in the in-betweeners and everything. That all worked. But what's intrinsically wired throughout my body is comedy and, you yeah. know, watching my mum my whole life. And so to me trying some stand up and doing that stuff seemed the most natural thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean sh like closing the Absolutely door and, all that, and, and and feeling uh, ashamed of all those other things no. from before. Not at all. As I say, I've got it all stuck on my wall at home. But how does that girl who's mm. so confident, so in control, deal with all people really want to talk about is who you're having sex with? Oh God. I had a good look back <laughs> and some of the shit that's been written about you. I know. I don't, words I don't like even slag, look anymore. Yeah, yeah. Slut. Yeah. All of these yeah. derogatory words that yeah. are thrown, especially at women. I don't mm -hmm. think it would have been thrown at a man, let's no. be honest. No. But just because you're a confident, single mm -hmm. woman. Yes. How did that make you feel? And I know you've said before in interviews. Yeah. You know, I just let it go over me. What yeah. off the back? Oof. Bollocks. Yeah. Because I know that's not you. Yeah. I know that's not you. I mean, being single in this industry is is really Difficult. tough. And also naively, I thought that being in a relationship and being pregnant made them leave you alone. And oh, if anything. It doesn't. It, no. it doesn't. So there's always going to be something. And I, I put up a picture of myself with a with my pregnant bump recently. And the headline was, you know, um, Emily Attack shares racy snap with wearing barely any clothes. I'm literally got a big old baby in my stomach. That's like, disgusting. But it's you know, it's clickable and people, it's all about sex. And people will constantly, constantly say to me, but but you talk about this stuff. The the whole reason why I write stand up about my sex life is to to take to Ownership take control of, of that narrative because it's going to be pushed out there in a different context anyway. You know Is there a time that you think it all went a bit too far? Yes. Uh, there's there's a lot of times where it went too far. I think you could really relate to this. So you know what it's like when you get a phone call on a Friday from your publicist. I mean, my publicist rings me and yeah. I see his name. He has to answer beating. the phone with, nothing's wrong. Yes. Because same. it's the most fearful name that can mm. pop up on my phone. Yep, same. And I feel like I've done something terrible and I know I haven't. Yeah, totally. Um, so the, the call comes in on a Friday and they say, the papers have a story. This is what it is. And I go, but first of all, most of it is incorrect. Um, and I say, well, no, this is going to be awful. This is so private. Sorry, they're going to run it. They're going to run it. So um, what do you want to do? Uh, How do you want to handle this? Yes. Yeah, so we get on a, we have a crisis meeting on a Zoom, heart pounding, feeling sick. Um, everyone discussing you. Everyone talking about me. I have to 
go through every detail of this said story. And what we're we um, talking like a relationship style. It's always to do. Or it's always to one do night with stand. Dating. Something yeah, like that. yeah. It's always to do with um, a guy. And just as a side note, there have been stories out there where you know there've been people I've never even spoken to, and it it becomes yeah. a story. So, you know. I have to go through every detail of... Uh, this is what happened. Yeah, this is what happened. Uh, like an interrogation. Completely. So everyone's discussing um, my body, my sex, my everything, talking about all these really personal, private details. Um, and luckily I have a great team and they're, you know, they're as sensitive as they can be. And then it's backwards and forwards with the paper saying this could be very upsetting and cause a lot of distress please don't run it. Please don't run it. Sorry, we're going to run it. Great. So Sunday comes round, the yeah. whole weekend's ruined. You're just waiting for this story to come out. And then the story hits and you are completely, you have to close your doors, close your blinds because there's photographers outside your house. You put your head under the pillow and it's, it's just the most, the most awful, lonely experience, especially when you're on your own, you know, you live by yourself and you see all these articles and it's not just one article. One article comes out and off the back of that, then of every single paper. You know, people say, you know, don't believe everything you read. Everyone believes everything that they read. My mum brings me on a daily basis yeah. going, I didn't know you'd yeah. done this. Yeah. I didn't know you were saying that. I'm mm -hmm. like, what are you going on about? Yeah, my family are kind of going, so, well, what is this? Oh my God, what's happened? You know, they're discussing it on... Loose women as a yeah. topic, it or, you know, a to it always you know, becomes a topic on yeah, loose women. It's a topic, and and all of a sudden people are talking about your life as though they know about this particular thing, yeah. such private detail, and you just can't believe it's happening. And that's something I'll never get used to. And th and then I remember this one particular time there was I read this article saying how um, Emily Atak's love life and and dating history and why it hasn't worked. And this woman was supposedly a psychologist. Are oh, they always are? And the, the headline it's was... when they chuck in the body language expert. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and His hand was slowly this yeah. way, which meant he was hurting inside. Yeah, yeah. And notice how the man turns away from Emily. This must be painful for her, you know. And I read this article completely picking my character apart, completely, this, a person who's never met me before, yeah. saying why she thinks that my love life is going down the fucking drain. Don't I know it, love, already. Cheers yeah. for reminding me. Thank you for telling everyone that as well. And, you know, the, the headline was something like... Um, uh, Emily needs to take a step back from love. Oh, I'm sorry, Gillian. What the fuck has that got to do with you? I know. And then, and in a world where it's impossible as a woman to get it right, because, you know, one minute you're a strong, independent woman flying the flag for all the single ladies. Next minute you're pathetic and you're crying in, into your kebab. I don't like throwing into the kebab. I don't like throwing this word around loosely, mm. but it's almost like mass gaslighting. Yes. It's... Putting thoughts in your head that it's, aren't there already. I've read stuff about myself Yeah. where I sit there and go, am I? Yeah. Am I this person? Yeah. And yeah. look, I'm not slating journalism by any means. Mm. As you very rightly said, we need that for mm -hmm. the job that we do. Mm. And touch wood, 90% of the time, I've got a great relationship with the press because I understand. Yep, I've got a good relationship they've got a job here to and do. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they've got a job to do. I've yeah. got a job to do. Let's mm -hmm. all work together and have a lovely time. Yeah. But, you know, I think I was actually with you when it was happening, when I had my own thing come out mm. on on a Sunday morning where I had mm. the call on the Friday and it was mm. involving drugs and that I was asking for drugs. And it got to the point where I literally let it run yes. and wanted it to come out because I knew it was bullshit. Yeah. But it was the fear, mm. the actual fear of mm. going... Did I ask for drugs? Yeah, yeah. Did I do this? And I knew I hadn't. Yeah. But the way that it works, like you say, you have that meeting where the papers are letting you know it's going to come in. And mm. I remember saying, well, well, show us this video then. Yeah, yeah. Unless you've got concrete evidence yeah. of me doing drugs off of someone's mm. penis. Yeah. For argument's sake. And it's a 4K HD video. Mm. Then run it, darling. <laughs> Then yeah, run it. Yeah. I wish you the best. The other awful thing as well is you don't know what to do because you don't know whether to, if you call it out as bullshit. You're then making a bigger deal yeah, with it. And everyone goes, it's yeah, better to say nothing. Yeah, Bollock, I can't. Well, I snap. said nothing during that yeah, one. Yeah. And everyone else it did just, it for you, me. We're like, are you fucking taking the piss? It's and that wildfire, isn't it? The story it? was front page news. Yeah. And the headline was Rylan, mm. give me the gear. And it was one of those classic crime watch grainy video screen oh, grabs of no. like that. Oh. And no one reads the story. No. And the second line was mm. the star who was clearly joking 
so the naughty. Star it's who naughty. Who was clearly joking. And they go, well, we put that in, so we're, you I know, I could have lost right. every single job I had. Exactly. Well, that's, that's the main thing. Every single job I had. Yeah. And because of that headline that yeah. they knew was untrue. Yeah. But to, to do that to mm. someone, they can do anything. Mm -hmm. And in your case, mm. for someone who's gone through such a tumultuous time in the press anyway, mm. with being a woman, being mm. a girl of a certain age, doing the the jobs that you did yeah. and, and playing the roles that you played. Mm -hmm. It's unfair yeah. to sit there mm -hmm. and list every single person that you've dated. It, and that, I don't believe they want to personally ruin my life. I don't think that oh, they... I don't. Hate, I don't think they hate me and they're trying to ruin my I'd life. I'd like to think not. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I just think it's, at the end of the day, they, to them, that's, what, that's what's going to sell their newspapers, gets them clicks, but... Yeah, it's just sometimes they don't really truly think about the person and at the, the end of it. And the repercussions it could have. Yeah, and it can be, the repercussions are, they can be devastating. Like, I'm just but, glad they've never printed my sexual history. It'd be like the fucking mm -hmm. yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> but this is it, and it's just like, yes, okay, I'm a young single woman. Yeah, yeah. It's a lonely existence when it's about, uh, when, you're, when you're single and by yourself. And I constantly thought when I was single and I was reading all these headlines, I thought, well, if I was in a relationship, this wouldn't be so bad and men wouldn't be so talk about me in such a gross way. And I don't know. I, I don't see it changing. I can't see it changing. The The narrative that is pushed about women, especially single women, and especially women who dare to be sexually liberated and talk about these things, that's always going to happen. And this is why I kind of do my campaign work and I, I kind of try and change this narrative that's pushed about women. What made you do that? Why did you sit there and go, bollocks to this wow. i'm not doing this no more someone's got to be a yeah. voice for these people well i just think from it, it was from my personal experiences through my life whether it's online or offline you know sexual assault and sexual violation has played a huge part in my life i noticed there was a reoccurring theme throughout my life of of men that were treating me this way that spoke to me in a certain way because of roles that i've played in the past because of this pin-up because they image. thought they can yeah but again though this has got nothing to do with the lads mags and the choices I made in my career, they they were my choices. They were all in my control. It's the reaction of people when you do those things, the reaction of men that don't have any self-control. That's not my fault, but I'm blamed for that behavior. Well, yeah, a lot because of people of would the, blame you. Yeah, uh, you know, because wrongly, of the career choices I've people made. People go, well, you're getting your tits out yeah. in the magazine. Yeah. So what's the bloke so sending you, you a picture of his yeah, dick? Yeah, exactly. And it's a narrative that's pushed that women are whining and complaining and they want they want both worlds they want to be able to put up a sexy photo in their bikini on their instagram but they don't want to see a big swollen purple knob you know on their phone and people are saying if you do that you have to accept i'm going no 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 you don't that's mental and that's the that's the thought process i'm trying to kind of really change the work that you've done there is incredible thank you and I know you're going to carry on doing that. Yeah, big um, time. We can't wait to support you on that journey as well. You said earlier about growing up in a family that's under the spotlight. Yeah. Helped you get to where you are and be that confident person. You then go through this patch where people are just constantly bothered about your private life. They're yeah. constantly bothered about your sex life, who yeah. you're sleeping with. Mm. And then you get to a point where you finally do meet someone mm. that you know's right. Mm -hmm. And we're sat here now. We're baby. We're a baby in your belly. He's kicking right now. No way. Yeah, he's kicking. He's proper kicking. My God, just think my voice is affecting babies. Oh, no. They're unborn. But you know what's interesting is that I naively thought that, you know, being being pregnant and going through this part of my life, I thought that would protect me in some way. It hasn't. No, no. Hasn't at all. Um, and people are always going to want to know about your private life. And it is, it, of course, there are certain things about the industry you have to accept that if you are in the spotlight, um, you, you know, yes, there, there is interest in your private life. Um, I know what I signed up for and I know what I didn't. And there's a game you have to play to a certain extent, you know, when you walk out of a restaurant and you do your smiles and your waves and that's fine. But the following home, sitting out, literally camping outside your house, all that kind of stuff. That's something I'll never get used to. And yeah. it's something I don't think anybody should get used to. But you have got to this point in your life where from someone who has spent time with you yeah. can see that you are really, really happy. Yeah. And how does that feel? It feels great. And it, it makes all the other bits way more bearable to kind of deal with. So, you know, 
I just feel a little bit more content and not so lost. I, I, I've in my life I've felt very lost and I've felt quite lonely and especially when it comes down to relationships. Especially, yeah. I'm now living for something else other than myself and I'm literally growing a human. Genuinely, yeah. And it's the first time I've ever really committed to something. And even though I feel sick every single day, <laughs> I, well, well, actually, to be honest, I was hung over all the time before anyway. Now it's just a permanent hangover, but without all of the fun mistakes the night before. <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel, I feel way more content. And also I feel very ready for motherhood. It's almost like every step I've made in my life, in my it's, and my life has all been about my career up until now, really. Yeah. I've made the right moves at the right time and it all felt right, whether it was an acting gig, the jungle coming, you know, bit motherhood is the next bit for me and it feels right. It just feels like that's what I should be doing. Right. You really believe that as well, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I haven't had a drink for nine months, which... And that's how I know been you're being honest. Clear head. <laughs> You know, I must mean it. Em, I love you. I love you. Thank you so much for God, coming God, I on. wish we could go to the pub. Not yet, darling. Not yet. Not yet. We'll wet the baby's head. Too. <laughs>